Sisyphus was trying to push the rock up the mountain. The dude is just trying to get a rug. That's his boulder. <laughs> Good morrow, friends, and Hello. welcome, welcome, welcome to Classic Movie Banter. You know that podcast where me, that guy Brenton, and that other guy at the end of the table, Nathan. Hello. We talk about films that are 20 years or older. 20 years, or in this case, Nathan. 23 years, Brenton. That's right. And we tell you, our friends, family, mangoes and other fruits, w- <laughs> if those films are still worth watching today. And uh, more importantly, if they're worth getting your mates around on a Thursday night, pour in that scotch, whiskey or bourbon and having a good old watcheroo. <laughs> I just, like the, like, the more you do this intro, Brenton, the more I'm, like, guessing what your ideal watch party is, because I'm, invi- I'm imagining you've invited family and friends, and then on the table is some mangoes and fruits with, like, bourbon on the side, yeah. and, like, and you're really yeah. getting into it, but everyone's like, ah! Is this a combo we want? Like, <laughs> ooh. <laughs> I feel like this is a conversation I kind of want to start now with our special guest this episode because, Nathan, we're 139. We're just we're just having guests in January. Like, why not? I know. So, uh, we, I thought I'd invite a, a very, very special friend of mine, Mr. Eamon Moses, who ooh. is actually uh, the host of a podcast, which you may or may not know, called Hunting Hunter. Welcome, Eamon, to the show hey. to talk all things movies. Thank you for having me. I'm very, very excited. <laughs> the reason that I bring Eamon at this point is that instead of uh, going to our our, uh, our listeners to get some uh, suggestions for what we should review, we actually... Uh, just got Eamon to pick <laughs> We dragged us. one into so, the room <laughs> against their will. <laughs> uh, so Eamon chose uh, that classic movie, The Big Lebowski, Wait, released in 1998, and it was directed by the Coen brothers, Joel and Ethan, What a Time, starring Jeff Bridges, John Goodman, Julianne Moore, Steve Buscemi, and others. So many uh, others. <laughs> mm. So many others. There's a, there's a lot of actors in this movie. So yeah, man, uh, thanks, for, thanks for bringing this to the show. Well, something I wanted to chat about quickly before we get Eamon to pitch it to us is that, Eamon, this is the third... Coen Brothers film we've reviewed on Classic Movie Banter. Really? And yeah. it is the second it is the second time actually that a guest has bought a Coen, Coen Brothers, Brothers film for us to review. People seem to like them. I mean like Nathan can't get enough of Hail Caesar, but uh oh, fuck <laughs> I really that. can't. Yeah. It's oh, good. Well, we've had we've had what 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 are we fucking reviewed? I can't even keep track anymore. It was it was Barton Fink and it was Fargo, wasn't it? Rachel brought Fargo after we did um Barton Fink. And it was really funny because like she was like one of our first guests. And, well, and <laughs> I was like, Oh, I don't want to review Fargo. Everyone knows it's really good. But then I was watching it and I'm like, Oh, there's some things in here I didn't notice before. So here here we are. But without further ado, Eamon, could you please pitch me in your own words the big Lebowski? <laughs> <laughs> it's just reading off like the Wikipedia synopsis. <laughs> <laughs> Can you pitch me the movie? We've got the Coen brothers, the classics, on the scale of the films like Fargo, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, No Country for Old Men, even though it was nine years later. Imagine, if you will, a noir film where nothing happened. So you've got a huge, huge name cast. You've got Jeff Bridges, John Goodman, Steve Buscemi, Julianne Moore, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Flea, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Sam Elliott, among many, many other names. I mean, the basic premise of this film, of course, we're told Jeffrey the Dude Lebowski major slacker in life, someone who just wants to spend his days bowling, drinking white Russians, doing nothing, just smoking joints, chilling out, living in California around the time Saddam Hussein's still in power. You know, just a regular, <laughs> regular way to do stuff. But somehow this this crazy lone slacker is pulled into this whirlwind of mystery. He's got nihilists, he's got high stakes bowling, he's got crazy Spanish dudes with painted nails. He's got all these things going on. He's got <laughs> teenagers that really in the whole essence of the film is just coming down to he wants a new rug. Like... That is okay. like you have you have life goals. <laughs> like Sisyphus was trying to push the rock up the mountain. The dude is just trying to get a rug. That's his boulder. <laughs> so does he go to like rugs a million or something? Like does he just go to the shops? Like <laughs> Well, I mean he's a slacker, so he can't buy a new rug. So he just needs to try and find ah. someone somewhere. So, you know, like how do you find you do you steal it from someone else? Do you and just the events that take place within that from there are just one to the next. But I think what ties it together perfectly is it's a noir film where nothing happens. I think that's just what kind of ties it all together brilliantly of the Coen brothers. So what you're saying is it's like if film noir met like Seinfeld. Pretty much. Like and like imagine Casablanca, but <laughs> the not like the Nazis rocked up and so this is this is a crazy tangent. 
Imagine Casablanca, but he just didn't do anything. And the events all resolve <laughs> themselves anyway. She gets on the plane. He is looking at you, kid. But just because he does nothing but drinks at the at the hotel. That's pretty much the film. <laughs> <laughs> if I can that sum would be it up. Great. I would love to see Casablanca with like Jeff Bridges and Julian. <laughs> I think that would work so well. John <laughs> John Goodman playing it again, Sam. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for the pitch. It's an interesting one because it's like because you sound so emphatic about the way that you say and nothing happens. I know. Normally I that's like a that negative. There's some listeners out there going, What? <laughs> what I, I I watch movies for the happenings. I mean we don't like we don't we, we don't like the happening. <laughs> Every time, every time Brenton just walks into a cinema, he's just like, oh, I hope something happens, you know? <laughs> just rubbing his hands together. Like. Plenty of happenings on today. Oh, so many happenings. <laughs> so he wakes up every fucking morning. He's just like, oh, so many happenings in my schedule. <laughs> oh, you're uh, summing up my life. Yeah, so thanks for the picture. So is there, so out of all the Coen's filmography, um, Eamon, is there, is there a reason you chose Lebowski in particular? For me, Big Lebowski is just, it's you, you know, do you ever have one comfort film? Like, no matter what it is, you can watch mm. it 500 times, laugh at everything, never get tired of it. Like just every, and even like sometimes you'll find new things. Like I don't know what made it, but The Big Lebowski just resonated so much with me as a film that it's just something I enjoyed every bit of. Like there's no mm. bit of the movie where I'm like, oh, it's this scene again, or oh, it's this moment. Like, <laughs> Every time yeah. I thoroughly enjoy watching it and it could, I could be flicking channels and it'll be on. I'll stop what I'm doing and watch it. Like it could be, I've had it on my laptop. I've got it on Blu-ray DVD. I've got like five posters in my room of it. Like <laughs> that's amazing. It's, I think for me, like it's just, it's my all time favorite film, like top of my letterbox, top of my list every time. Like, I think it's just, it, it'll forever remain like the big Lebowski. Like you'll never find another big Lebowski. <laughs> this is my big think, Lebowski. <laughs> <laughs> this is mine. There are many like it, but this is my own. <laughs> <laughs> they say there's a big Lebowski. I'm the biggest Lebowski. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, Cohen yeah. Brothers, incredible filmography. Like, you know, Oh Brother, Where Are Thou, Fargo, No Country, Ballad of Buster Scruggs, it just came out. Like, incredible Western film. But no matter what, like, something just always pulls me back to Big Lebowski if I have to choose. I just want to know, when you first watched the film initially, did you immediately have this response? Did you immediately go... Oh, like, you know, this is, this is, this is the movie for me. Or did it take another viewing or did it take, was it in a couple of days later that you were just still thinking about it or what was the experience like? That's a really good question. I think you probably, you're probably quite right. It was probably maybe the second viewing or so, like the first time. Cause yeah. funnily enough, my first introduction to the knowledge of this film's existence was a college humor video. So it was, um, what was it? Right. College humor, the Tron Lebowski or something. <laughs> it was a parody trailer of the big Lebowski, but it was Tron legacy. So it was like, he lives on the grid. He's this lazy guy who like goes to light disc battles and stuff like that. And I was like, this is kind of funny because I loved Tron Legacy. I thought that was awesome sequel. Great film. Like another Jeff Bridges classic. Imagine if they crossed over the soundtracks as well. So like Darth Plunk, Plunk was playing like in the middle of the Big Lebowski. Just like. Oh yeah. Just bring it back. Um, <laughs> they're, but, they're just hanging think, out in the bowling alley. <laughs> <laughs> there's in the background in one scene. I think, yeah, it was that I, ne I never really knew. I was like, okay, what is this based on? And then I read about it and I was like, oh, this sounds like a cool movie. Like I should watch it one day. And I think it came on when it was on TV. I was like, oh, I've always wanted to check it out. And then I watched it. I was like, okay, I see a lot of the jokes this is pretty funny and then i was like maybe i want to watch it again and i think from like the second third time onwards it's just like i just enjoyed it so thoroughly and just this sounds a lot like cocaine hmm <laughs> didn't like it the first time but suddenly you can't stop it <laughs> <laughs> put this in my veins thought so get jeff bridges in me yeah the, the reason i asked that is because i think i think i had a similar experience but i think i guess let's get let's get into it let's rip the band-aid off as it were when i initially watched this uh because again it, this had been touted as like one of those great movies but i'd never really understood why it was great like no one ever really explained why this movie mm. was great no one Brenton needs a lot of explanation you know like real <laughs> Yeah, sit downs yeah. like movie A to Z like <laughs> I need I need I need you know I need drinks I need but was the caterpillar very hungry yes he was Brenton like <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah it's I, I I take a a long time for things to seep in but so so I sat down to watch it I thought it was I thought it was quite funny I was like oh this is quite funny 
Look, look at all these scenes. Look at all these funny scenes. Look at these funny happenings. And and I, like I I enjoyed it enough, but I was like, I don't know if it's touted as like you know one of these great movies. And and you know in the Coen Brothers film filmography, it's quite you know random where it sits. And I was like, oh yeah, cool. Yeah, I thought about it for a little while after, but I but I I kind of left it there. And then I came back to it at some point about a, a few months later, I think. I think I start to understand kind of what this movie was going for and why it was so awesome. Mm. And every time I watch it now, I think I just get something new out of it yeah. it's, it's like a pokemon mm. it just keeps evolving <laughs> you know it's a it's a it's a charizard at the moment and i'm like is it gonna go to an x or a y i don't know <laughs> like you know Christ like where, <laughs> what's going on um so yeah like i i do appreciate that and it's one of those movies i think and and it's similar to a few other coen brothers films in that sense as well that the first time you watch it like it's mm. a it's a great experience the technical mm. factors of the m- movie shine through but at the same time it's that it, your experience with it i guess evolves nathan do you feel similarly or does this resonate with you at all or how do you feel about the big lebowski because i've got no clue what you think i yeah i yeah like like i was in college and i found it tricky i found it really really tricky when i first watched it because everyone's like yeah it's got this amazing reputation and normally i get suspicious whenever i want someone when everyone someone's like oh this film's like fucking excellent i'm like is it though so i remember sitting down at like aged 18 and i remember being like oh it's funny like it's really bloody funny but i remember thinking like oh i i wasn't hooked into it and then yeah Mm. i watched it a second time and like this is now the second time i've seen it and i'm like oh i still get what everyone's saying and and like Mm. and i was petrified today that i was gonna still dislike it because i thought that'd be incredibly awkward like (laughs) because i I would just like sit here and shit on it what's everyone loving while you two like rave on but no like i get it i do finally get it and it's so funny all three of us can agree immediately that like the first time you do it you're not gonna love it like sex it gets better you know just like don't let the first time be like your metric for it mm. and this and this film is quite the experience so like you do oh, meet yeah. a lot of people and like this this almost feels like like an anthology play almost like you just kind of you, you, you're so right yeah, Evan. you're, yeah. you're kind of just like you're just cruising around this this small little area of los angeles like the plot's not that important you're not you're not buying your nails to see how shit gets resolved you're just you're watching these kind of these two guys like jeff bridges and um and john uh goodman just kind of fuck about <laughs> and, and just see them interact with all these weird people and one could argue the film's incoherent in that sense because you just got random characters that don't really speak to each other they're just kind of being yeah. random against each other and they're all kind of bibbing and bobbing about but like you could also argue it's a plus because like it makes each scene so memorable and iconic because you only get these characters for a handful of time well yeah it's, it's like even the casting like David Thewlis is in one scene as a random guy who sits on an armchair and just yeah. kid is laughing the whole scene and that's it. You never see him again. But you're like, sure, David Thewlis, like award winning actor. Like <laughs> that, one- that's what happened to Lupin. <laughs> he didn't die after all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like I think that's again, that's kind of a Coen Brothers thing that they bring actors who are huge names and huge iconic images, but then just surprise you how they use them. Like I mean. In mm. uh, example, Ballad of Buster Scruggs, they've got all like Liam Neeson. Uh, you got Liam Neeson, Brendan Gleeson in scenes like they're in like one scene, and then that's it. Or like uh, barely any lines. Be like, cool, that was great. Like Tom Waits is the gold panning miner and stuff like that. Like I think that's just yeah, it's just testament to Coen Brothers how they do their filmmaking. Yeah, yeah. and their casting as well. Like because again, uh, the performances in this I think are actually really really strong. Yeah. Even though Nathan mentioned that you know everyone's a uh, everyone's pretty quirky and and literally you know, everyone. Is- <laughs> Um, just, let's say yeah yeah but at the same time like i think i think it, like you know the performances are still really strong and and y- you guys might agree but i think they're actually quite grounded i think that like you know these this is these are just like insane yeah. situations with eccentric people and uh it's fun seeing them interact on on their own on on their own levels oh i can't talk about spoilers yet that's okay uh so, but there's a, <laughs> there's a scene that i think really highlights that at the same time like the moments that we do get that are super like human and and kind of grounded Around the piece uh, are all the more better for it because they 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 I guess they're highlighted in that sense when you have moments where characters you know are maybe flailing or falling or you know like yeah they're all very flawed aren't they like no one's like yeah, a polished yeah. person in this like they're all no, just, they're all losers, yeah. essentially like <laughs> they're yeah. all idiots yeah absolutely and the next thing I want to say is because the way we've like you know we're talking about this is that it's all kind of like zany it's like oh whoa you know but in terms of the filmmaking and the technical side of it it's so intentional mm. like the cinematography 
movies off yeah. the chain, like how they how they use the camera in, in scenes and how they reveal things and the the color palette of this movie. Thanks, and, Roger Deakins. Yeah, Deakins. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Again, again, like the sound design, like everything is just like absolutely off the charts, and it's to support this this narrative or this lack of narrative mm. and these just kooky characters. And so I find that the filmmakers, uh, again, as as in a lot of Coen Brothers movie, just kind of settle the piece and, and are able to help focus the energy of, as to what we should be focusing on. And I think that's why, like, every time you watch it, you probably get something new out of it because there's so yeah. much going on that, like, maybe in your first viewing, it's a bit, it can be not overwhelming is not the right word, but it's, um, despite it being a simple plot and a simple a simple premise, there's there's still complexity here. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I don't know. I feel I feel like yeah, it's it's very sporadic and like it's very hard to recommend a, a movie only once because I know like people who watch a movie and they're like, oh, it's not for me. And like no matter how much you beg, like, they won't give it a second, third, fourth, fifth. Yeah. Minute. So it's like so it's it's hard if they don't love it the first time to get them on board. But like so and it's funny because like first viewing. I would be very surprised if there was nothing no one liked about the movie because like it's so charming in a way. Mm. Like, yeah, totally. Like, totally. like, like yeah. it, like it does a very smart move of, of like, introducing you to these characters early on and like you immediately like kind of wanting to know how they kind of came about. And the film is smart and it never really explains kind of the origins of anyone or why all these characters are so <laughs> idiosyncratic. So, so, and you're kind of just you just kind of sitting there. And you're like, oh, okay. So I think repeat viewings if you're kind of confused the first time will reward you maybe not with those answers but maybe hints as to how these people got there in the first place Mm. yeah yeah and that's that's yeah. a funny the coen brothers originally had in the script how like how does the dude have all this money and it was going to be a line drop but then they're like no oh, actually, really? yeah apparently he was going to be the heir of the he was an heir of the inventor of the rubik's cube so Amazing. <laughs> that's how he had his, <laughs> his flowing income but then the coen brothers were like Actually, no, it's kind of better if you just don't know where he has this money coming in from. Like, it's just yeah, like... Yeah, it's funnier. And this is a very funny movie. Yeah, exactly. Like, you don't need that explanation. You're just like, yeah, he just exists. Like, the dude exists. Like, he lives in his apartment. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and like, and this, because, you know, the dude is the protagonist, he is a very unreliable narrator at points as well because he is so kind of just all over the place this movie. Just like, he's smoking heaps, drinking heaps and that kind of stuff. So I remember when in my first viewing, I was so convinced this was all just some weird acid trip that like Jeff Bridges was having. <laughs> Because it was just, and like this, this has dream sequences and all that kind of stuff. So I'm like, mm. ah, are we, is this any of this really happening? Like there's very mythical characters in this and it's all very allegorical. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I think what you brought up, Brenton, in the sense it's, it's grounded in reality, especially with character motives. I think there is something very true to this film. And despite how comedic and, yeah. and all over the place it kind of is, I think there's really important themes kind of embedded into it that kind of gives it that grounding a film like this needs. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's what gives it the staying power. That's what gives it the, the relevance the importance and it's why we're, I guess we're talking about it and I think that's why Eamon brought it today because because even though like it's you know on it, on surface value it's this it's this kooky thing and may, maybe you watch it and you go oh yeah you know that would that was fun that was really funny it's got that staying power of that it it'll keep you thinking about it I think um, to a certain extent uh, but like you said Nathan like you know uh, it, you, the movie's not for everyone and I think there will be some people that'll be like my mother for instance my mother <laughs> my mother but, let me tell you a thing about God my mother, mother. <laughs> but you know like this is the type of movie that she's just gonna go oh it's stupid and like never finish it you know what Ooh. I mean like, like no 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 mom not not me the movie <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah like there's just people out there that just won't buy into that and, and, and that's fine but I think I think a lot of people will and Nathan charming's a really really good u- word to, to use to describe this and that charm I think is what's gonna keep people hooked and then the staying power will be those those themes that you mentioned and again like if you're a fan of just movies like the filmmaking in this alone is just like worthy worth the asking price Mm. I couldn't recommend it enough actually I think that you know like I think maybe it won't be for you but at the same time like if you give it a chance I think there's something here that can be really powerful but also really entertaining so it's a lot like oh, art yeah. like like that first look at like a big bob, a big like fuck off painting in like a museum won't do it for you like you gotta come back you gotta <laughs> sit in front of it it reminds me of like Skyfall where like James Bond is like staring at that ship and like Q's like oi how cool is this ship and James Bond's like it's a fucking ship like you gotta you gotta have that attitude with like this movie like you know what I mean like like at first, you're just going to think, what are all these people just doing? And they're just fucking about trying to find some money. But, like, I think there's something important here about, you know, the poor getting fucked over by the rich and about the little guy kind of losing to the big guy. And, like, mm. I don't know, there's there's lessons in here. I'm like, oh, this is how you do a ransom. Like, I, you know, like, yeah. there's <laughs> there's things you can get from this movie. So, yeah, I, I, I would say it is worth that second watch, but kind of 
be ready that you're not going to be there that first watch, which we've already kind of like heralded. Hmm. If you like swearing, this is a great <laughs> movie for that as well. It is fun fact, everyone. Oh th- man, this is the sure. this is the 26th ranked film with the most fucks. It's got 274 of them. Damn, 274. That's a good number at a rate of 2.34 fucks per minute. So but at any rate, you can just play a fun little drinking game for this. So <laughs> so sip every time you hear one, and, <laughs> and you'll be home by the end of it. <laughs> It also has a 147 uses of the word man. That's uh, oh, the, word, perfect. the word man is said about every minute and a half. Oh, uh, if you love those words, and boy, this is your cookie. Like. <laughs> <laughs> if, 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 look, if you like, if you like man and fuck, I have, we have the film for you. That's Brenton and combine them together, and and you're good to go. <laughs> As Nathan says, you're home. So, oh, brilliant. <laughs> well, do you guys want to write this? You're fond of me lobster, ain't you? Like I said, uh, I couldn't recommend it enough, I think, for all the reasons we said. Uh, we've been quite, I think, like vague. We haven't really mentioned any specifics. No, because there's a lot of surprise in this film. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, see, so we want to leave the element of surprise and, and mystery. and So, yeah, so so um, my recommendation is, is that people watch it. I understand it won't be for everyone, but I think it is for a lot of people. So mm. enjoy The Dude Abides. Brenton abides, and uh, what do you guys think? Yeah, I'm, I'm oh. all for it. Like again, like if if this was my first viewing, I would be shitting on it so much. Now I'd be like, but this doesn't make sense. And what was the point of all that? And like I would just get to that kind of nitpicky mode. And like if you are that kind of person, you, you do that with movies. Like pull back, just like <laughs> try and when you first see the dude, when the opening shot strikes, and you see that dude walking down the grocery store. Just like try and look like him. Be like let that set the tone of what you should be going into this movie. Because like <laughs> if you're not as relaxed as the dude, exactly. then you're not gonna feel the dude. And you're no, this is a film you feel, not a film you watch. It's a film you kind of have rub over you. So with that, with that intimate metaphor, I say thumbs up and give it a watch. You've already heard enough of my points. I absolutely recommend thumbs up, give it a watch. It's just, again, as you guys have perfectly said, the first time you watch it, you might enjoy things, learn some new things. But again, it's just something you can come back to with new friends, yeah. old friends, rewatch, find new stuff. And I think every time, like you'll never walk away from the Big Lebowski disappointed. In after yeah. everything that happens, like you're always like come away with maybe a new message each time maybe you'll find something new and think about that by the end of it but i think you'll never walk away being like wow did i really just spend two hours watching that like you'll be like awesome i spent two hours watching that like what what's next like <laughs> but yeah i think yeah i think it's just yeah <laughs> and if you get the opportunity it. i i if you get the opportunity i know this is a huge cult classic right so like you know when you know theaters return in full form like i think midnight screenings would be perfect for this wouldn't it like because there's oh, a huge culture dude, for that. Yeah, i'm man. fairly sure like the hayden orpheum has done it regularly I know event cinemas at George Street that hopefully will bring it back. They had a program called In the House where it was just like right. cult classics. And it was sick. I went and saw Blade Runner, the final cut with a mate. I saw Aliens on my own. Like they just show movies again. Oh, um, perfect. Like, it's perfect just to like go. I, I'm pretty sure one season they did The Big Lebowski. I'm sure they'll bring uh, it yeah. back again. Like now things are going to be yeah. back in full swing. Yeah, true. Since there are like no movies coming out, they'll like just dump all the classics and they'll be like, great, Lebowski, Honestly. let's do it. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And look, this is such like a, like in a way, like, I mean, like visually, it's really striking and quite beautiful that I think it's, it's definitely worth watching on a big screen. Oh, you know? yeah. yeah. Get, get a bigger screen as you can find and pop this thing on because it's going to look, it's going to look Don't damn Don't be fine. watching this on your iPhone 4. Come on. Like, this is. <laughs> it's not what Martin Scorsese intended. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. No, he'd be weeping. Just like, uh, I, do, I do like to think this somewhere in the world. Martin Scorsese says he's just watching his granddaughter watch just like something on the phone. He's just like, he's just <laughs> flipping a, a table. Like. Yeah, I reckon she's watching like Ant Man and the fucking Wasp and she's like, <laughs> like he's just like. <laughs> yeah. Also, that, that Simpsons character who's like, like, he just keeps on shaking his head. Like, that's that's what Scorsese does. But he does some boss Nass action. <laughs> Walks down the backyard and just stares at the leaves falling from the tree. He's just like poor Martin Scorsese. <laughs> oh. uh, we like his films, except for the Last Temptation. But yeah, hey, I I think the Last Temptation's worth a watch, Nathan. <laughs> oh, sure We've had this it. debate many times. There's so many times. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not here to talk about Last Temptation, are we, Brett? We're here to talk about the Big Lebowski. Hey, man, it stars Willem Dafoe. Man, let's say that like Big Lebowski. The only thing that could make it better is if Willem Dafoe oh made God. an appearance. Let's be honest. He'd be a perfect shoe in somewhere. Has he ever collaborated with the Coen Brothers? I don't think so. No. Oh, he must have some point like. I think it'd be awesome. I think that's a match made in heaven. Google Google Cohen and and Willem Dafoe. Like he like Will must have worked with everyone at some point. Like he must have done something with him. But I can see him in the world of Big Lebowski. Kind of just I can see him maybe as like a competitor bowler. Maybe just like a real like smooth like he knows what he's doing. Or maybe even like the judge 
for the Boeing competition we never see. Like, I could see, oh, I could see him being yeah. like an adjudicator or something like that. I feel like he could just rock up as Norman Osborn, like in any <laughs> film ever. ever and it'd probably, it'd probably just work out okay. Like, you know, like maybe he just like, <laughs> just like, like <laughs> the dude's like, what are you doing, man? I'm something of a scientist <laughs> myself. <laughs> I don't know. Before before every dream sequence, he just rocks up with his happy guess. He's like, sleep. <laughs> <laughs> every time he misses, like, uh, every time he misses, like, the pins, he, like, shrugs and goes back to the drawing board. He's like, oh, back to formula. Like, <laughs> 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 uh, oh, love it. Well, let, let's spoil this movie, shall we? <laughs> You spoiled it. What? The movie. Oh. So, so Eamon, I just want to start off by chatting about something that's very important to all of us here, and that is faith. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's talk about let's talk about the inherent bias that we've not failed to mention that Eamon may have for this movie. <laughs> so, it, obviously, the film. Well, not obviously, if you haven't seen it, but but in the film, you know, uh, we the dude abides. You know what I mean? And and due to the popularity, like the Jedi Order from Star Wars, a religion has spawned. Yeah, exactly. Like like Pastafarians, you know. Where <laughs> we've, 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 there's been a religion that's come come full circle and it's all based around dudism. Eamon, you could tell us more though. You know, we're, 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 we're simple, humble beginners. <laughs> you and I are like Liam Neeson. And no, Brenton, Brenton and I look identical to Liam Neeson and Andrew Garfield from Scorsese's Silence. And we've rocked up in like feudal Japan and we're like, <laughs> oh, if someone knows about dudism and like Eamon just rocks up in a fucking robe, just like, come in boys. <laughs> I have much to share. <laughs> so I'm um, very very happy to why i'm so happy to be able to discuss this film is uh i'm officially an ordained priest <laughs> in the church of the latter day dude a uh dudist priest if you will i was ordained on the 9th of may 2015 i've got the uh digital certificate still saved on my phone uh and so yeah dudism it kind of came around from just like so there's another thing the lebowski fest which was like a yearly everyone would come together make white russians or wear the cow chance sweaters long hair like just all the dudes come together and they watch the movie and it started from this one guy mm. who he's living in thailand now i believe and he really just kind of took a lot of the he pretty much just stole a lot of the tenets of like buddhism and hinduism the very kind of you know live live peacefully and you know like you calm and stuff like that but kind of re reverse engineered it (laughs) to fit the big lebowski to fit jeff bridges and so i guess the general idea and like tenets of dudism is just literally like chill like life goes on like he pretty much just cribs all the quotes that the dude says of like you know well you know that shit like life goes (laughs) on man you can't worry about that shit like you know just drink a cocktail let's go bowling like and i think it was like it's just funny like it resounded with me so funnily as an idea I was like oh yeah like you know just live a chill life and then I was like oh no way you can get ordained as a priest like that's awesome apparently in the state of Nevada I can officiate weddings was it a whole process to get ordained? No, it was literally just <laughs> to fill out your details online on the Dudism website. <laughs> Listen, if you start now, by the end of this episode, you too could become an ordained minister yeah. of Dudism. Honestly, you just go online and then if you want to pay extra, you can get yourself oh, a card. You can get a little, little business card that's, you know, got all your details on it. You can buy a certificate. Funnily enough, one of my tattoo artists, he's also a dude priest. And I I found out that, I think I was chatting to him about the Big Lebowski, and he showed me he has a little tattoo of a Buddha, but it's the dude. And then on his wall in the studio, he's got his certificate of ordainment. <laughs> That is so ah. Because like, I'm wondering, because, like, you know, in the same way, you know, Mormons, like, ask, you know, like, oh, have you heard of Jesus or whatever? Like, that's how they start the conversation. Do you, like, go up to people and ask, like, have you heard of Jeff Bridges? Like, <laughs> it's like, have you heard of the dude? He's like, do you know the word of the dude? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Have you abided recently? Eamon, if you rocked up to my door, if I had a knock on the door, right, and you rock, rocked up and, and I opened it and saw you, you know, in your robes, and, you know, you, you, you didn't even hand me a brochure and you just said, have you heard of the dude? I'd invite you in, man. Like, I'd invite you in and we'd sit down and we'd. I'd, by the end of it, I'd probably be able oh. to marry people in Nevada as well. You know, like who knows? Like, hey, but speaking of which, I know, I know where I'm getting married now. What's like, that? jeez, Bro, it'll be. We'll link that into the episode of uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. I could see, I could see the dude popping up at that point. You know, just oh. like they're all like so ridiculously like high and fucked up. It starts Johnny Depp, right? Oh, I'm yeah. trying to remember now. Yeah, Johnny Depp, uh, Benicio Del Toro. That's right. Yeah, they're getting mm, fucked up. Yeah, that's right. Yes, yeah. the collector himself. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I could see, I could see, I could see in the <laughs> apartment. You know, just Jeff Bridges rocks up and he's just like very lost. 
<laughs> they interview him and start the whole religion. So we're going to be like, oh, I'm in. It could cross over. <laughs> it could cross over. It's so funny because like I mostly know Jeff Bridges before this from obviously, from like Iron Man. So uh, it's so funny seeing him do this because like he's such an antithesis of like Robert yeah. Stain. I'm like, bless. Mm. <laughs> well, I, I kind of I kind of withheld my opinions on Jeff Bridges' performance for some reason. It just didn't really come up. But like, yeah, it, speaking of Jeff Bridges, I like I think he's just a fantastic actor, isn't it? And a and a and a, and a mm. good dude, you know. Uh, pun intended. Uh, like in terms of his performances, I'd say his top three, like the ones that always stick out in my mind, uh, have always been like Iron Man as well, Nathan. Just due to uh, you know, obviously, because Tony Stark built this with a box of scraps in a cave. Uh, but also, <laughs> but but also, um, I love him in another Coen Brothers film, which is the remake of True Grit. I think he's fucking awesome yeah. in that movie, yeah. and it's Absolutely. so worth watch. It's like one of my film. yeah, it's it's one of my favorite westerns actually. That remake, I just think oh. it's awesome. Like he his his uh his chemistry with um. What is it? What's her name? Haley Steinfeld? Haley Steinfeld? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think yeah. they're Kate just, Bishop herself. That's definitely worth a watch. But obviously, if you're going to talk Jeff Bridges, like the performance of performances from him is clearly the big Lebowski. He's just so... It's like, it's the role that stuck with him. Yeah. Like, he, like, no, no, he was born to play this. Like, like I don't... Like, obviously other people could give their, their take on the dude, but I don't know if this film would um, be as popular as it is or, you know, have this cult-like... Be a cult-like ph- phenomenon. Yeah. If anyone else apart from him had played the role and it's so funny because he's so f- he's so funny in this like, like he's not really and, like, when I think of his other big roles he's not that funny like in them like he does drama so mm. well like my favourite Jeff Bridges performance is um, Hill or High Water which came out a couple years back yeah and yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Oh, and he's, yeah, and like, he's yeah, such yeah. a good dramatic actor. I'm like, it's just so weird seeing him. Like, because also, if you know Jeff Bridges in real life, you know he is like barely acting in this movie. He just is Jeff Bridges in this. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> he's this war- and that's like half the half the wardrobe in this film was his own wardrobe. <laughs> really? Like, oh, I didn't know. That does not surprise that's me. Awesome. Yeah, the 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 jelly slippers. Like he brought them on Conan O'Brien show a few oh. years ago, being like, "Yeah, I've still got them." Like, <laughs> They were just literally like, just bring in your wardrobe. Let's see what you got. Did John Goodman do the same thing with his underwear? <laughs> oh, man, <laughs> they did. That's a choice. <laughs> oh, could you imagine? Could you imagine if like John Turturro like, had the same thing as well? Christ. Like. <laughs> Speaking of which, because we know John Turturro from obviously Nathan and I watched Barton Fink and enjoyed that film as well. And Transformers and didn't enjoy it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Coen brothers are pretty well known, like, you know, as, as, as other directors are as well, like, you know, Chris Nolan's, that they all, they'll get actors and they'll stick with them you know what i mean yeah it's fantastic to like see like jeff bridges and both this and also how different his performance is in true grit or you know john chaturro how he just rocks up for a few scenes in this but then he's like the star of barton fink or john goodman's also a side character in, in barton fink and he's the he's the side character yeah, here but those characters are just absolutely like flipped on their head couldn't be more different and uh i think they just have a knack for good casting and finding mm. the people that are right for the role and trusting people or well, trusting actors and artists to to give their all and to do something different different than they had done up to that point in their careers good point every time those actors nail it like i I just think they're they're really got a knack for finding actors that are right for the role and also actors that can that do their best work with these directors i think that's just the mark of a good director that if the actors always give good performances you always go well clearly like the director's putting trust in them yeah one thing but also are able to get out of them what's required for that part even on if on paper it might not seem that they can perform that role that's a really really good point and it seems like these actors also continue their relationship like I, I was watching um an interview with the three of them jeff um steve and uh john or whatever and like they were all like chatting about the movie i think it was like it's like 20th anniversary or something and they still seem to love each other and like hmm. love chatting about this film uh, i think it was jeff bridges hollywood star ceremony like mm. he brought out the jacket again hey. and, like john goodman was there for him and like so I think, yeah, I think it probably is a film that tied them all together. And it's totally. funny, like, with the casting, like, apparently a casting joke that Steve Buscemi is Donnie being told to shut the fuck up every five minutes by Walter. Apparently that came from his character in Fargo speaking so much. Right. People were like, oh, Steve Buscemi's a really busy role in this film. He talks so much. So the Coen's like, let's have him get told to shut the fuck up, like, every five minutes. Like, he has no idea what's going on in the movie. And I think that's just brilliant. Like, it's a, almost a movie crossover of, like, yeah, well, that's what he did last film, so this is what gonna do this one like it's just classic little moments like every time Steve Buscemi talks in that movie and then it's like Walter is like shut the fuck up Donnie but then he agrees with him <laughs> yeah or well, only when like he says something important like where he says oh they like posted the times where I like shut the fuck up wait a minute what'd you say like, <laughs> like, like wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> it's like they're gonna confront uh, the kid and he's like oh yeah we're gonna go he's on this way and then <laughs> seriously he's like and then near the in and out burger he's like shut the fuck up Donnie and he's like <laughs> 
And then, yes, near the in and out, we'll get some beers, get some burgers. I love that. <laughs> yes. I love the fact that they did that. That did come from Fargo, though, because I could so see exactly that's what William H. Macy needed in that movie. Just like, just, just got John Goodman oh, by his side. Oh, like, oh, like the second, up. like, you know, Steve Buscemi's like, where's the money, Jerry? I could just see, see like, John Goodman just like <laughs> stepping out of the car, just being like, shut the fuck up, Tony. <laughs> just, uh. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a fun little time as well, because doesn't Steve Buscemi lose his ear in Fargo or something like that? He gets shot in the ear or something like that. He's clenching onto it. He does. He gets like shot because I remember him like yeah. holding it because it's bleeding. So what a fun little turnaround then <laughs> that like as Steve Buscemi dies, one of the henchmen loses his ear as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it'd be it'd be even more like ironic if like one of them just for some reason just like fell on like a wood chipper, like just like Francis McDormand walks past. She's very concerned. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's like, amazing. yeah. Do you, do you get it, audience? Do you get it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Great Fargo very subtly. What did what did we think of those Germans, the three of them? <laughs> oh, I think they're like yeah. the it's it was it Peter Stormare, uh Flea and I love that you know the names. Like you'd have to by this point, wouldn't you? Like <laughs> Oh yeah, and it's just like I just love it. It's just, the fucking money love yeah. <laughs> It's like, the shittiest <laughs> accent as well. <laughs> it's just like and then like they bring the fucking ferret in and drop it oh in the box. It's <laughs> just <laughs> like <laughs> it's like then he's like we cut off your Johnson next time <laughs> where does this come from like, uh, it sounds like insults like 12 year olds would say at the playground like making fun of each other but like the, the, these adults are genuinely saying it yeah, oh, yeah man. 100% it's so funny a lot of the villains as well and this are weirdly sexually charged as well like, I think there's definitely something going on between yes. those Germans oh undoubtedly like and that's just it's that weird like kind of leather outfits they're wearing the fact they're in like a craft punk yeah. band or whatever like, or their album uh, arts bo- Jesus or, or no Autobahn, Autobahn, that uh, was the name. <laughs> like some weird industrial band, and then was like all the weird sort of, and of course log jam, and that's the best. It's been cable fixer. Jesus Christ! <laughs> Just that terrible porno scene. Though. Oh my god! But yeah, I think there's like there's a hilarious energy between those two. Absolutely, yeah. I, I wanted to talk a, a quickly just about another scene and the differences between the two Lebowskis, as in the big Lebowski. Oh right, dude. yes. This scene, this this introduction scene, when when the dude goes to the big Lebowski's mansion to inquire about, you know, his and get compensation <laughs> because they went to the wrong Lebowski. That scene is just absolutely brilliant. Oh, and it's one of those moments, genius. Nathan, that probably yeah, states that theme that you were talking about before in terms of like, you know, the little guy versus the big guy and whatnot. And just like the sense of like their priorities oh. and their differences. But I've always found this scene just absolutely hilarious. And I've always loved the big Lebowski as a character, just like yeah. in his wheelchair, rocking up and just like how he just spouts this jargon about, you know, about, you know, bums what? and... What? <laughs> and, and and the right way to live and whatnot. And it's and it's it's absolutely hilarious. And it's so funny to watch Jeff Bridges try to like navigate these waters of like, dude, I'm just like I'm not these like I'm not yeah, I'm, you run. <laughs> yeah man, you like the I'm, wrong message, man. <laughs> and it's just absolutely brilliant. And I think that actor just does a fantastic job mm. in that chair, like when he just bursts into the room like every He's scene. So violent. And, and obviously the the climax of his character as well when he finally comes face to face with John Goodman is just no. absolutely <laughs> hilarious it might be one of the funniest moments in the film because the build up is like oh wow is this when a mystery is going to be solved in the sense of like oh cool like you know maybe he does he is a liar and and his legs do work Mm. and then it's just not the case (laughs) at all (laughs) you don't trust John Goodman because like he's had so many theories the whole fucking movie and like and most characters just don't believe John Goodman so by this point as an audience might be going like nah he's weaving bullshit like he's been weaving bullshit the whole movie so it's so funny when he's completely right (laughs) it's just like to pay off even yeah. more. And, like, and that's so funny. Like, the the dude guesses the plot of the film. He's like, is when they're first talking, he's like, yeah, they gave me the money. They gave me a pager and everything. He's like, look, she probably just fucking kidnapped herself. She yeah. disappeared <laughs> for a week, went somewhere. And she was drunk. He literally guesses the entire plot of the film at the start. And you're like, you're, you're left running the whole time until they finally reveal it at oh, the end. It's like, so funny. And I think what what makes the big Lebowski work so well is his character, Philip Seymour Hoffman's oh Absolutely, as, yes. As Brent. Yeah. Is yeah. just like, every time he does his facial <laughs> expressions or like, when Bunny's like, I'll suck your cock for $500 and then he's just like, <laughs> oh, she's funny, isn't he? Like, it's just he, like, he has that performance that you're like, and like, 
God rest his soul, but like, he, like he is one of the highlights of that he's movie. Absolutely, every scene. Yeah. like he just delivers. Like I think the Coen brothers perfectly. Cast. And he is the setup. Yeah. He is the setup to that punchline because the film. I think the script does a lot of work there too. Even though the acting is so fucking brilliant, the script spends so long hyping up Big Lebowski himself. Like we spend yep. so much time in his hallway looking Ooh. at all his awards and his pictures, and it's like yes, yeah, so she. It was the first lady actually, and like you see Philip Seymour just like setting up that punchline, <laughs> and then that's the the key of Pasadena. <laughs> <laughs> I love like he's trying to drum. He's like he was given that for uh 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 yes that's the- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's like he's such a like a parrot that he just doesn't oh. know. Like I love I love uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman even when like the focus isn't on him. So I love in moments like say in that that scene in particular when he's just kind of in the in the background of shots right. Yeah. And he's still got his facial mm. expression oh. going and it's in like the limo? they're having it all out in this room right and they're all just like he's like Big Lebowski's like fucking losing his shit and he'll just be in the background and you just see him smoking there like everything's all good like you know like yeah. this is just a day in the life. In the first scene where they're like they call him in it's like bunny's gone missing and then like the big louse is like even men can cry and it shows grand he's like bawling his eyes out and he's like not making a noise it's oh. the funniest shot oh like. it's too good <laughs> it, it, it really is too good well speaking of uh other characters as well i wanted to talk quickly as well about julian moore's character what the fuck is going on with julian moore <laughs> this movie like <laughs> it's what <laughs> fucking like what is going on I don't even know where to start I mean a lot of people have very openly and happily talked about how pro-feminist her character was and how good it was for the film yeah that's something that's talked about a lot in discussions of this film is how strongly pro-feminist it was by Julianne Moore's character and she's an absolute oddball which is perfect for her character Mm. I mean her first scene is like do you find the male form of like the female form too intrusive vagina Yet men can talk about their dick or Johnson or Rod. Like, it's just so, like, again, it's the scripting that complements it so yeah. well. But the thing, like, I can't think of any other actor who or would take her performance. Which is really interesting because she's probably the only prominent female character in the movie that, like, gets a lot to do. So it's very funny yeah. that it's not, the film itself is not inherently feminist in that sense, but she is. And I think, like, the absence of other women mm. in the cinema, it's almost meta in the sense that she's kind of that woman who's propped up and, like, it's making a statement on the absence of women and how she kind of stands out for it. And, like, it's been so, like, it's such, the whole movie been a dick contest essentially between all these different guys like especially since half of them work in the mm. porn industry so it's kind of funny that she kind of calls it out if that makes sense yeah yeah absolutely 100 percent. yeah and it's just nonsense as well jesus the art she's making like gee, like <laughs> the facial expressions jeff fridges makes when looks at it when looking at it is exactly what i was doing i'm like what are you doing like <laughs> oh unbelievably pretentious like jesus can you imagine meeting her in real life just like like the character and just like you go to a gallery and, and like you know she's like presenting this with this work like you'd have no fucking clue man like <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, you just feel like, yeah, interesting. That's, that's great. <laughs> yeah, jeez. I wanted to quickly state as well that I think one of the best reveals in cinema is in this movie. And it's actually the ending when we see who the stranger is, who we see who this narrator is, you know what I mean? Like, uh, at the very end, and that mm. reveal of Sam Elliott is always just like, I've always just loved no, that moment. Time. Like, I've, I have I, think, again, it's just great casting, and, like, they've got freaking Sam Elliott there, like, you know, arguably one of the best voices in cinema. Um, Him and James Earl Jones, basically. Like, you know, have that... Ca- <laughs> I oh. would pay any sum of money to see a Sam Elliott Darth Vader. I think that would be incredible. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I, was, oh, I was just thinking, Next there level. should be a film just called, like, the voice and it should star sam elliott james l jones and morgan freeman and like just oh, just just, just, go, just like, like, the they're all trying to narrate the same documentary but they have to try and interrupt each other like that <laughs> they've all got the same script <laughs> like. but again it's just one of those moments where you just go and it's at the very end of the film and it just makes you like jump out of your seat and go like what, what the fuck like you know like the, uh, yeah. who's this you know like what's what's going on and so again it's one of those moments that in a second viewing you kind of get what that moment's going for and what it's all about and, and I guess what he's actually saying because the first time I watched it I was just like oh I was so excited with Sam Elliott and then the movie was kind of over and then like the second time I was like wait what the fuck mm. like you know um, what's going on with the ba- there's a baby like you know is there's a little Lebowski what what you know like well it's- we know that <laughs> like, like we, we could tell that early on because like Julianne Moore's like oh I want to have sex with you so like I can have a kid and Jeff Bridges is like oh okay and it's mm. so funny because even though so much of his issues come from the absence of money the film solves that form immediately by giving him like a rich like you know mother to his son or daughter so like there's great mm. irony embedded in that but it's so funny you brought this up Brendan because this is where I disagree with you I don't think I loved that final scene because the reason for it is because I don't think I needed Sam Elliott to tell me what the movie was about at the end 
per se. Like, I like him. I love him throughout the whole movie. It's funny he's in it three times, at the front, the middle, and at the end. But, like, I feel like it's him kind of saying, a little, it's a little bit like, you know, Porky Pig at the end saying, all's well that ends well. It's like, I didn't need to be told the themes of the movie, if that makes sense. I don't know if he's necessarily spouting the themes of the film, though. I, I think it's there, like, you know, as a... I, like, because I don't think he's there just telling you what it was all about or what it was doing or whatever. I, I really don't. I think it's there as just, like, an end note. It's like the end cap on just on just this story. And it's like, you know, it's it's this stranger, it's this cowboy, it's this wanderer that is just kind of... um That is kind of, I guess, again, like, grounding this movie in a sense of, like, this... In, in in this mythical story of like all these crazy things and just being like yeah man like <laughs> this is just this story that I like to tell from time to time at a bar mm. you know and uh, I was I was just here at this bowling alley and you know or maybe he was or maybe he wasn't and and this shit was just going down and yeah man I feel like it's a I feel like it's a story to tell you know like it's not I don't think it's necessarily there to be like hey this beating over the head this is what it was about I think it's just there as like a as an end note as something just to to lead you out of this of this crazy world again what do you yeah. think I- I, I almost looked at it as if the stranger was like in mythology, the Greek chorus. Yeah, yeah. good so point. In old tragedies, the Greek chorus, they laid the scene for the for the audience. They gave a song about what's I happening. The of Sam they then went into the ensemble. They let the story play out. Would then step in again in the middle, sort of refresh what's happening step back into the ensemble, let the story play out, and at the end, deliver their message. Like, you know, I, I can never forget the Greek chorus of Oedipus. I remember studying it in university and things and always how it kind of... <laughs> it's the Greek chorus just, like, you know, stepping up, being like, Medea was pretty fucked up, wasn't she? And then, like, everyone just kind of leaves. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I feel like the the stranger, yeah, he kind of, you know, he's very... In his opening monologue, you know, he's talking about city of Los Angeles is the city of angels. I ain't never seen any angels. And, like, he's... It's almost cliche, like, but almost deliberately cliche in a bit like yeah Yeah. and then in the middle like he's not really delivering on the story but he's just kind of like how you doing dude and like and then (laughs) there's some funny references that he is kind of omniscient that he's like yeah you have to use so many cuss words he's like the fuck you talking about he's like well whatever and then like at the (laughs) end like it's they're chatting again and then the dude's like oh we'll have a good one man and then the stranger's like well there you go like it's kind of that classic, like, yeah, it's, it is a bit of, like, putting a pin on it, sort of leaving you with what the story is. But for me, it always kind of, yeah, I don't know why, I always just kind of saw it, like, as the Greek the Greek chorus of a story, being like, you know, here's our parting wisdom to you, like, the dude abides, like, that's the, here's, here's the end of the story for you, like. Mm, I did think at one point he was God. I remember my first viewing, I'm like, is Sam Elliott God? And I'm like, in real life, yes, but in this movie, I don't know yet, so, like. <laughs> <laughs> It'll take repeat viewings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I look at that man's moustache and I'm like, I, I, I will never grow that. I'm like, I wish I could, but... No, uh, no, 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 no. Nothing will ever match. Well, should we talk about some special segments? Oh, please. Should we, should we get into some saucy topics? <laughs> special segment! Ooh, so special. Which character was the most crazy in this movie? I feel like Eamon would be a great person to answer this first because, like, after all your viewings, if someone is still insane to you by this point, like, that says something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I honestly, I have to say, I reckon it's easily Walt, John Goodman's yep. character, Walter. Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> he's not not crazy as in, like, you know, psych- like whatever tenets of crazy other people look at, but it's just he's, like, his hair trigger temper, he's always, like, his words have to be the words, like, the continuous, like, the Vietnam reference is the funniest <laughs> thing ever. Like, yes. no matter what scene he's in, it always <laughs> oh. has to be, like, my buddies didn't die face down in the mud so I could get told this shit, <laughs> and he's, like... And even it's he pulls out the gun on Smokey. Also, we have no like, proof that any of this happened. Like we just know he went to Vietnam. Like, we don't have any of this stuff actually. Like that's the thing. Yeah. Like did he like? And I'm pretty sure the dude questioned him. Like, did you even go to fucking yeah. Nam? Like at one point, he's like, he doesn't say yes or no. But like, and he like every scene he'll hijack to make it about Vietnam. And so Jeez. I wouldn't say he's, he's crazy and like you know he's loopy, but yep. like, he's just this crazy ideology that like Nam so affected. No wonder him. his wife left him. Also, he pretends to be Jewish still it's like even though he's <laughs> that was a funny so he present he's pretends to be jewish the name of his security company sobchak security ss oh my little, god uh, cohen brothers detail <laughs> it's just he's like like donnie's funeral brings it back to nam <laughs> yeah meeting larry the kid brings it back to nam sitting in a coffee shop complaining i didn't give my god given right so i get told off in a coffee like 
it's always Vietnam. And I think, and then the dude at the end just gets so fed up with it. He's like, what the fuck is Nam? Like, and so I think I easily, yeah, I reckon Walter's character is like the craziest. Yeah. Have that. you ever had a hug in a movie? Like the one that like John Gibbon gives to Jeff Bridges? Like where you're just like, your arms are down and like someone just wraps their arms around you. Have you ever had that hug before? Mm. Yeah. And was nothing, there's nothing better than that hug. I, I'd have to agree with you though, I mean, I think what makes him again, like so crazy is uh, that he never, he he's never not at 10. You know what I mean? He's never <laughs> not at. He never goes below. It's like 10. Brenton every day, am I right? <laughs> every everything is just super high stakes. Like it, mm. it never goes below a ten, and you can see why at the end that the dude has that breakdown moment where he's just like, "Fuck, man!" Like just because he is the polar Ooh. opposite of the dude in that sense. Yeah, everything, it, everything is high stakes. Every you know, nothing, nothing is. Um, but he does you know, wind it down. He does I, like one of the best gags I think about him going from crazy to normal is when like he's talking to the Germans at the end. And, you know, Steve Buscemi's behind him. Yeah. And he's shouting at the Germans, but then he speaks very softly to Steve Buscemi. It's like, no, 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 they're not fascists. Mm. They're nihilists. And then he's like, no, they're cowards. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's just so bipolar at points. Like, so I think he can yeah. pull it back. Like, even like when he smashes that dude's car, like the second he realizes he's fucked up, like he does try and apologize, but then like he just scurries off. Like, <laughs> I completely agree with you. The man's fucking insane. The fact he'll pull out a gun in the middle of a bowling alley, it's like, what are you doing? And still go there afterwards. <laughs> like, you see the police yeah. walk up as they're driving away and you're like, Jesus, it's a miracle you haven't been arrested yet, mate. Well, it's funny that you bring that up, Nathan, because that leads us perfectly into our next segment, which is who should have died in this movie, ah! in my opinion. <laughs> in my opinion, if anyone was to pass on uh, that didn't, it would be John Goodman's character. Like, the fact that he's still living and, like, he, he gets himself out of these situations <laughs> that he puts oh. himself in is absolutely insane for me. I'm just like, what? Like, like if you pulled a gun in a bowling alley or, like, you know, uh, that, have, uh, uh, that kind of level had or you know or that you're not that level headed that like you're going to run into some trouble at some point and I feel that one day uh, he might run into another someone who is also at a 10 and I think that uh, that would be an absolute disaster <laughs> yep. yeah that's exactly it maybe that's why Randall has such a vendetta in Monsters Inc because you know like Steve Buscemi remembers you know, <laughs> like, what, <laughs> what John life. Goodman was doing like, <laughs> he's like fuck you man <laughs> I'm going to steal the screams from your best friend they're, they're destined to do this forever yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, that'd be great. I oh, know. Do you think anyone should have died, Eamon? Is there is there anything you th- think someone should have passed? Honestly, someone else. I would have been surprised if they went with the big Lebowski guy. Mm. Yeah, was, that's a good point. Uh, maybe an initial like the you know either the stress of everything that happens in the movie or everything that he's called out on like like Donnie gives him a heart attack or something. Mm. I was I, uh, in the back of my mind, I did wonder like what would happen if he died. Like I feel like the status quo wouldn't really change for the rest of the characters. That's like, true. They'd still go bowling. They'd still. But I wonder how the the fringe characters, so how would Grant, how would Julianne Moore's character, how would they all react under the idea if the big Lebowski died? Would they blame the dude for it? Would That's they true. be like, oh, well, all's well that ends well? Like, yeah, he died. He was a penniless poor man in the end. Like, so I, that was something I did wonder once watching. I was like, "What would happen if he died instead?" Mm. Like, yeah. Mm. So that was that was the one that was the one I considered. Me, me personally, I, I I was convinced in my first watch that there was going to be Tara Reid because I'm like, she's just because she is like you know the MacGuffin oh, of this whole movie, yeah. and I'm like, you know, the fact she, if she can survive t- Sharknado, she can survive anything. So I wasn't I wasn't too surprised <laughs> that, <laughs> that she she didn't cork it. But like, I was kind of half expect when we see her drive away with her toes still intact. I'm like, maybe she'll just crash the car. Like there'll be some cruel irony to this like woman just like. <laughs> You know, just <laughs> <laughs> fucking about for a bit. That'd actually be really interesting, dude, if she, like, crashed the car. Or, like, it was just some, you know, something that was not linked to anything that, that happened to her. That she got her comeuppance, as it were. Yeah, because um, it's very Cohen for that to happen. They love their, like, their coincidental deaths. Mm, yeah. That's so Cohen Brothers, yeah. yeah. The TV show Fargo does it in spades. Like, they'd always make sure, like, characters die randomly for just stupid reasons. i got to watch that show, man. I've really got to oh, watch do it. it. They bring back the bowling alley. Spoiler alert for season three. You go back to the um, bowling alley from this movie. Oh, oh really? really? Yeah. It in. yeah, man. That's awesome. Sick. Yeah, Google it. If you if you want some more Lebowski and you... If, if Lebowski met Fargo, just Google season three bowling and, and you'll get a little treat. Well, that's funny. So the Coen brothers were very adamant that they they would never make a sequel to this. However, the only sort of element of a spin-off slash sequel that exists is John Turturro as Jesus. He put in so much to the role. Like, everything he did to the character, like... That's how he came up with the title, Jesus Rolls. Yeah. <laughs> 
yeah and so then then they made 2000 2018 it came out the jesus rolls which was a remake of the 1974 french film going places mm. have you seen it no i really wanted to but it had a really limited release right. but i had a look at the cast like it's a pretty unknown cast with Christopher Walken rocks up in one scene, Fantastic. apparently. Like, you know, why not? <laughs> why so, not? Yeah, apparently apparently the Coens gave Totoro the blessing to be like, we're done with the dude, like we'll never do a sequel. But yeah, yeah. if you want to make a movie with Jesus. It surprised me how little John Totoro, I remember him being in this movie a lot more, but he's only for like two, three scenes. Like, Yeah, like, yeah, two, yeah, like first scene introduction, dude's a pederast, <laughs> and then he's like, what the fuck is this show me shower shit? And then he's like, well, I'll fucking beat you at the next oh, game, whatever. That's man. one of my favorite lines from John Goodman, where he just like turns like Jeff Bridges and he's like, eight-year-olds, man. so out of it like it's great so uh that brings us on to our third special segment and that is do these characters learn the true meaning of christmas this segment is basically uh meaning that christmas is in fact like did they learn the true message did they learn did they did they did they did they learn something are they are they better are they better for it these characters it's a bit of a yes and a no because they the status quo beyond Donnie dying mm. and everything that they interact with the Big Lebowski. The world's not changed. They're still at the bowling alley. They're still bowling and drinking together. Mm. Like his car's wrecked, whatever. But like, and I, I guess it's kind of, it's that Coen Brothers nihilism almost. Oh, the nihilists. Yeah. Like the, the, there was no fucking money, man. Like she didn't kidnap herself. Like the, the, that's the thing. The dude kind of realizes everything and he understands it, but he just doesn't really give a shit. Mm. Yeah, like, he's like, you know, I don't have a hundred thousand dollars now. Like, I don't have all the extra money that apparently was going to happen. But I've still got Walter. We've still got yeah. the bowling alley. So you know, and that, and it, it resonates with his his mantra, the dude abides. That's his true meaning for him, I think. And then other characters, I think, yes and no do. Like, you know, they kind of reveal the big Lebowski for the terrible person he actually is. The nihilists get the shit bit out of them. Like, Walter mm. still kind of... I don't think Walter realizes or learns, but he's kind of content that, yeah, he's still got the dude as his friend. Yeah. Like, yeah. He, he at least has that. He has that by the end of it. What do you think, Nathan? Oh, God damn it. I was going to pass it to you, Brenton. Ugh. Delegating as usual. <laughs> I knew it. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, out of all of them, I, I like I liked to be optimistic because, like, Sam Elliott kind of hints at it at the end. He's like, oh, you know, good things are coming. You know, you got the baby coming and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah. But it's true. I think a big part of it is that they don't learn Christmas. And that's kind of why I like oh, I, I, yep. like asking this question because, like, I think this goes with a lot of, like, Coen Brothers films as well, to, like, like with a lot of that kind of stuff. Like, you see characters just kind of, like, it reminds me of, like, Frances McDormand when she's, like, um, you know, that final scene of Fargo where she's just, like, lying on the bed going, like, man, the world's pretty shit, isn't it? Like, <laughs> like and she's kind of tapping her stomach. Mm, yeah. Like, there's this kind of like man sometimes just dumb shit happens and like i like that the film kind of yeah. makes peace with that almost like it's not a growth thing but yeah. it's still there there's something to pick up on yeah so i think mm. there's strength in it going off what you both said for me yeah i i agree completely with, with what you both said but i'd say the only character i think that gets a true meaning of christmas moment is is john goodman in the sense of and amen you brought it up before i think that i think that there's a moment there which we'll talk about very soon where he definitely you know that he's realized what he's got like he's all he's got really is the dude you know, like, we, we get the sense of that. Like, there's not much else going on, you know, in his personal life. Like, who who the fuck else would put up with that shit? You know what yeah. I mean? So so, so I think he he has that that trimmy of Christmas moment in the sense of... That's one of the themes of the f- film as well. I think I think there's a really kind of big theme of, like, family and familiar bonds. And, like, you know, you your family is what, you know, is who you choose. Mm. And, 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 and I think that's a massive kind of part of this movie and the people that you choose to interact with and, you know, how you forgive them, how you, how you, how you move forward, how you live every day with these people you know like which mm. I, which Eamon like you know when you when you actually it's one of the reasons dude when you when you brought this film forward and were like oh I really need to talk about this like I think this kind of like perfect, perfectly personifies Eamon in a way on a personal Ooh. note of just being like he is the dude in that sense of like the dude abides he's happy to like forget, forgive and uh, and forget and move forward and think the best of people and just like and, and to move forward and choose your family and, and be someone that's like a beacon of just like you know fun and, and, and goodwill I guess so like of course it makes sense that you'd bring this movie forward <laughs> But I think in that sense that this is what this movie is going for. And I think um, John Goodman brings that in when he has that moment of like, man, I really fucked up and I'm really sorry. It's one of those moments, Nathan, that you said that he's soft. Mm. And it's because it's like his brother, it's his family. And it's like, you know, he wouldn't ever want to lose him. So I'm glad that we get to see that side of that character. Speaking of another side of this character, we we need to see what steals this movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
it's blinding. Because one of my favorite attributes of Jeff Bridges is that he's always wearing his glasses. Same with John Goodman. Like, they've always got their yeah. shades on. And oh boy, does it come in handy in this scene. It does. So what stills this movie is a segment on the show where either myself or Nathan, we pick a still, a single frame from the film we are reviewing. And we usually pick that on the basis of it being really, really funny. But sometimes yeah. it's just a beautiful piece of cinematography or something interesting to talk about. This could be both. <laughs> so basically, I'll, I'll explain it first. You can find this still on our social forums. The links are below. Basically, you know, they're spreading the ashes of their beloved friend. There's this... They couldn't afford to bury him. <laughs> this <laughs> this little eulogy given. And I love that it's all based around, like, we think this is what his wishes would have been. So, you Jesus. know, and we find out about his <laughs> surfing background or some bullshit, and we're like, what the fuck? <laughs> anyway, so they decide to spread the ashes into the Pacific, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they spread them and this huge gust of wind blows over and blows the ashes back over John Goodman's sh- shoulder in directly into the face of the dude who just cops it like a boss. Uh, and then after this completely just breaks down and loses his shit at his friend. And, you know, that person, like, what the fuck is nah, man? <laughs> so the still is basically... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the reaction of the dude to having one of his best friend's ashes just like thrown directly into his face, Jeez. which is horrifying beyond comprehension. But uh, I've always thought about this. Like, not only like is this my favorite scene, but we'll get into that in a second. But uh, I, I, this is this has stuck with me for many reasons because I just know now that I would never decide to throw someone's ashes like into the ocean. Like, I would just <laughs> oh, never. This must happen all the time, right? Like, like, unless you're standing by a river. Like, like I've got no idea. Like, you know. With, with ashes or like you know what what's right with them or like what someone's wishes are or where they want them spread but I've never felt right about that after watching this movie because I'm always like that would literally be the most horrifying thing like imagine like this is a horrible hypothetical but just you know you're, you're spreading the ashes of someone that you really care about and then suddenly a gust of wind just like blows that directly like in your gaping mouth like oh no God. thank you no thank you at oh. all I, I, it, like yeah, exactly your reactions there are exactly what I was after in the sense of I it, it it's kind of a terrifying prospect so that's on the one hand of what's going on in this scene and why it's memorable <laughs> on the other hand it's a really good scene and I love I love this moment that the dude just like absolutely like just like loses his shit and it's the moment that like finally after all this shit that's happened we we get a response out of the man of just like this is mm. fucking bullshit man like, <laughs> what, the, what the fuck's going on I didn't ask for any of this you know and now you're here blowing <laughs> blowing Donnie's ashes as in my face and then on the other hand this is just so funny like it is literally one of the funniest moments ever like I it, it never fails to make me laugh out loud that moment of just that reaction shot this still what makes this scene doubly as well as it just prior before the at the funeral home trying to talk with the director about you know uh, <laughs> what's what's the prices for for, a, for an Jesus. urn for a usual urn things like that it's like oh about 500 for a normal one they kind of look at each other and John Green is, John Goodman is like is there a Walgreens near by and then it cuts <laughs> to the next scene and it's a Folger it's a Folger's coffee can oh. they didn't even have the money to get an urn for their friends they just bought a coffee coffee I love that. case and then just dump the coffee somewhere put their friends ashes in I think what works especially in that still is just that Jeff Bridges has no reaction <laughs> yes. he is just <laughs> He's the, so stoic. All the ash hits him and he's in that pose. The only thing moving is his hair and he's just standing there and it doesn't take till John Goodman's like dusting his yeah. hands off, <laughs> yeah. like touching it and he just turns around slowly. He's like, Oh shit, I'm sorry, dude. I wonder what they would have used on set. Like, I wonder if they would use like real ashes, just like, not of a human, obviously, but like, just like. They'd probably just use like a dirt powder or something, I'm guessing. Like, probably some like easy, like. I love that, like, he has also no reaction. Like, he's just spreading the ashes. He's like, oh, how sad, you know, and he's like throwing the ashes. He's got <laughs> no idea what's going on. And then he goes, he, he's re- his line is, oh shit, has he realized like a little bit of ash just gotten on his sleeve? And he goes, to <laughs> yeah. brush off. and that's how he sees Jeff Bridges just like covered in this shit. It's. <laughs> so like oh shit and then he like has this reaction of just seeing what he has done oh it's, I'm sorry dude <laughs> it's so if funny. I ever see Jeff Bridges in real life I'm just gonna like just throw some ashes at him just to see if he gets PTSD I'm just gonna be like <laughs> see if like fans just throw more ashes at Jeff Bridges and be like for fuck's sake <laughs> <laughs> I, like, like that is literally one of the most horrible things that could happen to you oh. like <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking. When I write my will and I say, grandchildren, you know, my, my future offspring, when when you throw me over the, the cliffs, just watch out for the wind. <laughs> well, hey. Hey. Let's look at this film's poster. 
Blanton. Yes? Let's look at this film's poster. But is it art? So again, you can find uh, images of the theatrical poster on our uh, social forums. The links are below. We, we got a poster here. Yeah, well, yeah, well you've got this poster, right, Eamon? Yeah, so I've got, um, oh no, I've, I've got a different one, actually. So it's, um, I want to say those kind of spread ones where it's like multiple headshots. Oh, like, right, yeah, 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 yeah. And, Like bowling pins are forming like kind of a wave and stuff Ooh. like that. It's one of those kind of like, Here's the full ensemble of everyone. But this poster is quite funny because if you don't know this scene in the film, <laughs> yeah. like this is a this is him on a drug and he's been roofied or whatever. He's dreaming about being the log jamming guy, seeing Maud, who he's met like twice, wearing Brunhilde Valkyrie armor in a field bowling. So you honestly have no clue what you're what you're walking into looking at this poster. No. You're just like, is it a bowling film? Is it a Viking film? Is it a is it some is he some kind of electrician? Like what am I walking into here? So I think it it definitely teases you with a few ideas. The bowling ball, the bowling shoes, like just the dude himself. And I guess yeah, just saying the big Lebowski and the, the, the tagline times like these call for a big Lebowski. It's like very what vague, is isn't the big it? Lebowski like and actually a fun little um trivia in that in that scene the night the the dream sequence jeff bridges when he rides underneath all the women like on the the bowl where he's like the bowling ball mm, yeah yeah originally like he turns around he's looking under their dresses like whatever <laughs> haha, like apparently he wanted to do one take where he, he had his own like little fancy camera like and he wanted to shoot it as well oh. and so uh jeff bridges wife and daughter told all the extras all the women who were the extras is like for that bit where he's going under their legs to see the see the costume team and get some wigs and stuff them underneath the underwear and have them like peeking out from under the underwear <laughs> and so the shot where he's looking at them and his face is like the oh my god that was <laughs> them having like put extras like in the in their costumes that he's like what the fuck? <laughs> like, that's just a genuine reaction they film and he said it was one of the funniest things they could have ever done to him on set. I reckon this movie's got so many stories. Like, this cast, the the crew, everyone would have so many funny stories about just, like, shooting uh, some of these scenes. Especially, like, these massive dream sequences that are just, like, off the off the walls insane. Yeah. But, dude, you're right. Like, you're, you're right about this poster. Like, I think, like, with no context, which no one would have had back in the day, this looks utterly insane. And you're just going, what the heck? Yeah. Is, what the, like, what could this possibly be? I kind of like it as a poster. I like that it's intriguing. I like that it makes you ask questions kind of like the movie yeah. the only thing i'd say that i would improve upon it is actually i'd just change the color palette i think like the gold's yeah. interesting it kind of gives you that godlike image but i think it'd be fun to have some of the because i think i've seen the poster that you have Eamon, and it's a lot more colorful from memory I've seen the color palette like of the rug like it's that very nice red and like right. red yeah. and kind of whitish and a bit of yellows and stuff here yeah yeah i think it's smart as well not showing the other characters because like it makes it a, bit, a bigger surprise yeah. when you see them like mm. i completely agree yeah, I, th- I think it's fine. Yeah. Well, hey, shall we pass some of that power to Before the Before we do, let's do some title talk. Oh, yeah, Nathan. He's Nathan, done it I again. I love having you as a co-host, <laughs> mate. When, whenever, <laughs> I, whenever I go to skip title talk, you're always like, nah, man, fuck that. Like, get back How to it. Because right, yeah. it. it's cause like, cause title talk, obviously. <laughs> Ooh, it's the title. The Big Lebowski. Like, it's a very, like, it means nothing really. Like, like Lebowski and Big, like, 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 it doesn't tell you much about the film, does it? Like, <laughs> no. Like, you could, like, you could name it like funnily enough if you looked at if maybe even looked at that from a bowling perspective maybe someone could easily think is that a bowling reference like was there a a big lebowski Mm. in bowling or something is that a bowling move like is uh yeah it's it's, you know you could either be oh we're performing the big lebowski like is it a heist is it a bowling yeah yeah yeah. like it could be is it a name of someone because the big lebowski himself is not that prominent in the movie like no and that's that's i think part of the thing is that the big lebowski is this touted figure and then every time you see him he's just quite a yeah not a good like not a good person like he's stealing money from a kids fund and stuff like that like Mm. i think and and that's that idea like the dude is instead he's the big lebowski like He's the mm. one who's interacting with everyone. He's the one who's the main character. Yeah. There are other Lebowskis as well. Because if you just consider Lebowski being a surname, you know, you've got Joanne Moore. She's technically a Lebowski, mm. like, as the daughter. So one could argue she's the biggest Lebowski of all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, think, I think the title, though, is kind of a work of genius in the sense of it is such a super catchy, again, intriguing title. And mm. when, I, when I remember, I think, hearing about the big Lebowski, 
you, you I mean, instantly you're like, what's that about? Like, what is it? You know, who is the mm. Big Lebowski? What is what's the- his deal, man? <laughs> and it's kind of like I couldn't imagine this film being called literally anything else. Like, no, like the dude abides. No, like maybe instead of like who framed Roger Rabbit, they could do like who kidnapped who kidnapped like Lebowski's wife or something like that. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. But no, I think the title's perfect. Again, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it at all. Well, now, Brent. All that being said, <laughs> shall we now pass the power to the people? <laughs> Finally. Pass it here. What? The power to the people. So if uh, you all head over to the tomato meter, you'll find that the Big Lebowski has a critical consensus of 83%, which is pretty good, but an audience score of 93%. So people they bloody seem love it. to like this movie. <laughs> yeah. They like it. And it made some bank, which is really interesting because like, it cost $15 million to make and like made 46.7. But I think that's over time. I think it did okay theatrically, but I think just because it's had so many, you know, midnight yeah. screenings since, I think like, like Rocky Horror, it kind of built over time like i wonder how much money the comments get every year from just like lebowski screenings like they just get like a little royalty check flooded and they're like ah oh, yes <laughs> but uh if we head over to some reviews kevin carr from 7m pictures gave it a positive review thanks kevin and said on one hand it has many layers but on the other hand it's just about a dude who wants his rug back <laughs> 4.5 out of 5 yeah i think i think uh i think this is what we we're kind of talking about at the very start of the episode of that mm. you know this movie on at, at a base value seems just like a funny eccentric um, strange time but if you delve deep into it and you watch it you know and, and really let the themes gestate there's there's a lot of um, complexity here yeah I, I you know if you if you look if you look hard enough you'll find some complexity and um, yeah it's 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 one of the reasons that I think this film's lasted as long as it has it's there's a little something for everyone <laughs> like if you want a simple film you can oh. just giggle mm. at the jokes if you want a deep film you can plant your face against the, the TV monitor and try and look for stuff yeah I do that all the time yeah uh, no. my doctor says it's bad for my eyes <laughs> Like Brenton, but that's, please. you know, whatever. It's worth uh, it. I'm, I'm trying to absorb, like, photosynthesis, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what you said to your parents as a kid. Just like, <laughs> I want to grow like a flower. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm agree with that review. It's it's very, it's, yeah, it's a simple review, but he's absolutely to the point. Well, it's interesting because, like, Brian D. Johnson didn't like it from um, McLean's magazine. He wrote, what made Fargo work, aside from the uh, regional kitsch, it was a solid story, unbelievable characters worth caring about. The Big Lebowski has neither. Fwa! Shots fired Oof. from Brian. So yeah, so it says doesn't have a solid story or believable characters. Some characters are a bit large, like larger than life. But I mean, in life, don't we have people who are larger than life? Like, don't you have friends That's who exactly are sometimes right. like have moments like John Goodman, you know, they'll they'll rant on about something that they're a stickler with and eventually be like, what are you talking about, man? Like, yeah. I've, I know I've had some friends in the past who like rant on one thing for ages. And eventually I'm like, what do you mean? by that like and they're like i oh, don't know like and it's like like why do i hang out with you again like, <laughs> it's a claim that yeah there might be some characters who aren't that realistic maybe sure but i mean i still i easily go into it thinking like you would easily see these people yeah i disagree with this review entirely i think that believable characters again it depends on how you term believable but i think these characters are very believable they're just larger than life and we know people mm. from all walks of life yeah. that are these people oh no not the exact same way i don't know john Turturro, you know like <laughs> Speak for yourself, Brenton. <laughs> but dude, like I'm, t- I'm telling you right now that like you know, although like obviously these characters have their their quirks and whatnot, I think that there are there are, this this movie is about like those people that are larger than life, that are that are super eccentric and super out there, and th- th- that's what all the characters are. The really most normal character in this movie is Steve Buscemi mm. that I can yeah. think of that is like just a normal average guy, and all they do is tell him to shut the fuck up. Brenton's had a lot of experience <laughs> being that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's usually every episode of this podcast, you know. I'm like, Just Brenton, like, shut oh, up. Hey. And you're like, Nathan, it's an audio I'm medium. All, I'm all like, hey, I'm going to make this Sam Raimi Spider-Man reference. And, and everyone's like, dude, like, you know. <laughs> well, in another review, Asia Frey from, uh, I'm going to butcher this pronunciation, but maybe lag me up at mobile uh, at AL. Surely that must be a state. So they, they've given a positive review. The Big Lebowski is easy to love and rewarding to obsess over. But for me, it's more than just a fun movie to quote. It's a comforting memory generator. And when I watch, if I squint, I can kind of see my dad again. And that's like oh. that quote there is to me. Like it, it is a comforting memory generator. Every time mm. I watch it, I just always feel good coming out of it. Like I've never watched it feeling bad. Like, you know, if I'm having a bad day, I can watch it and feel great. Like if I watch it, I can really enjoy it. Like 
one sixth place I've seen the Big Lebowski at. Of all places in in Edinburgh, there's a bar called Lebowski's. Whoa. And it is a Big Lebowski themed bar. Out the front, there's like outlines of like three giant pinballs and like the dude holding a white Russian. You go in, they've got the movie on replay like 24-7. Amazing. They've got like bowling shoes everywhere and the entire drinks menu is just variations of white Russians. Incredible. Like, all named awesome. after the characters. It was, I went there, I walked past it with my cousin, and I was like, dude, bury me here. <laughs> I was like, this, no, spread no. my ashes spread here. Spread my ashes this here. Is, yeah, exactly. <laughs> just in the bar, just on the floor. Like, I'm set. Like, and yeah, that's the, this review perfectly feels it. It's like, you know, and this isn't a review that has to be like, this movie was a technical marvel. This was an acting feat. It was just saying it's a nice film to watch. Like Nigel M gave it five stars and said, I love this movie. Uh, became a Dudas priest. So Nigel, yeah, Nigel. Actually, uh, I'm, I'm Nigel M actually. I thought actually. so. Ah, <laughs> the face mask comes again. off. It was too long. <laughs> thought so. Thought well, I like so. to think about when I read this, when I read this quote, I wonder if there are people out there who become Dudas priests but haven't seen this movie. If like they just hear about like the religion first and they're, they're like, just, yeah, man. The church of the latter day. I get around these, the, yeah, these these concepts. That they've never seen the movie. Like, I hope there's <laughs> someone out there like that. I do too. Surely, surely That'd there is. Great. If there is, write in. If you're listening and you're a Dudas priest and uh, yeah, you've <laughs> never seen the Big Lebowski, write in. We want to hear from you. Hi, I'm Emmett. I was on the show. No, 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 not you. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Spencer W gave it five stars and wrote, uh, "It may be my favorite movie of all time, and I would recommend it to anyone who is struggling to see hope or goodness in a world where meaning and purpose no. are not always." so clear and obvious oh so touching that's true you know sometimes you never will get that rug mm. it's just about the journey getting the rug exactly exactly nathan it's all about the journey it's so funny seeing that contrast to the next review <laughs> jacob 20b gave it a one and a half star out of five i've tried watching it three times i just don't get what everyone finds so funny i mean you know man it's it's a journey maybe you just gotta try and watch it a fourth time now yeah, yeah. maybe <laughs> that'd be so funny just like like a month later we see another review <laughs> Yeah. Just like I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh but it's 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 funny. Like I've I've never really seen much of a rough review of this film. Really? But it's true. Like I know friends of mine at university when I said, Oh yeah, this is one of the films I've seen, they were like, nah, this is so not for me. Like they were vehemently against it. They're like, nah, this this will never grow. Yeah. So it just yeah, it just sucks. But then again, this person yeah. said three times, so like bless him for at least trying, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, it's it's he's not like he's not just watch it and gone on. Oh, no, that's it. Like you know, and I guess maybe it's the environment you watch movies in. You know, you're watching with mates who are all in the same humor. You're watching it by yourself, like just on your laptop or something like that. Are you watching it as Martin Scorsese intended on your iPhone four? Like you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Scorsese just writes a review for every movie just like watch it on the biggest screen you can <laughs> Francesco commented I love how everyone gets into his apartment without any care whatsoever which is just absolutely <laughs> so true I reckon he's just got that apartment like I reckon there's no, no lock absolutely. on that door I reckon anyone's allowed in at any time he nails the wooden board to the floor being like this is going to support the door <laughs> and then it's a reverse open door. So the chair just falls down. He's like, oh. Right. <laughs> it's awesome. So true, though. And lastly, Morpheus on YouTube wrote, I do that Jesus dance every time I bowl a strike, <laughs> which I now want to learn. <laughs> oh, man. It's awesome. Well, that is the Big Lebowski. There he was. <laughs> He's falling off his chair again. Quick, pick him up. Like. <laughs> what an awesome time. Like, I, I can say personally, I've had just talking about this film today. Uh, there, was, there was plenty to talk about, like I said, at the start of the episode. And I think we covered... But, uh, mostly everything, I think. So, um, yeah, thanks, guys. And most importantly, thank you, Eamon, for joining us today on Classic Movie Banter. Thanks it was a so joy to have you here today, dude. Oh, absolutely loved it. And thanks, obviously, for, for sharing with us your love for this film. And um, it was it was awesome to have a chat yeah. about like it. Like Jeff Bridges, our door oh. is always open. Eamon, if people want to find you... What is your home address? So, at current, you can find me on the major podcast I'm working on is Hunting Hunter, a Gonzo podcast. So, we are on every streaming service on apple google spotify everything's available brief summary into it is uh we are doing a look into the life of the famous journalist hunter s thompson so every episode we look at a new kind of facet of his life his writing his adaptations his renown for drug use uh pretty much is a very interesting character oh, yeah. so we've been in, we've been, we have been in a bit of a uh stasis right now we're just trying to get on top of everything back we should be recording some episodes again soon and we'll be back to it uh and another podcast that I can easily recommend that I've been working on and seeing is uh it's called Dual 
all of the takes. Very similar to this. Uh, <laughs> and it's a lot of fun. A group of four guys who do a weekly ranking of everything from top films, games, books. It's great. Four guys, uh, Jewel of the Takes. If you ever have a time listening, I know they put it on YouTube and they're also on Anchor FM, but you can definitely recommend them as well. Amazing. But uh, yeah, if you're ever in the area, you can always find me. Often. <laughs> He'll just, be at your local just bowling alley. always open like the Big Lebowski. Just come in, have a piss on the rug, you know, just just come come hang out. <laughs> ever, ever thus the dead beats. <laughs> uh, um, no, Eamon, you've been an absolute wonder of a guest, mate. Thanks again so much for coming on. Yeah. And we'll see you guys later in the week for some feature Fridays with the Banter Boys. That's us. That's what they call us, the Banter Boys, our <laughs> midweek show. They'll see us on the streets. They'll be like, there they go talking about movies how relevant for today's climate here they come it's those darn banter boys i told you harold i told you they were naughty come on <laughs> we had a great time last week uh, chatting um about dictator and all that so make sure you uh, see us again on friday the links are below in the show notes so hop on to our new show and we'll talk about new movies and new things that are less than 20 years what a contrast it'll actually also be less than 20 minutes as well oh <laughs> don't we love things that are less than 20 <laughs> If if you like today's episode, uh, send us a review on, on on iTunes. It really helps us out. And also comment on the YouTube videos, like the Instagram posts and the Twitter posts. Do what you've been doing. It's been absolutely fantastic. And we can't wait to see you later in the week and for a new episode next week. Nathan, you got anything to add, brother? Oh, just like I'm I'm ready to go bowling, mate, frankly. like <laughs> I want to see you do that dance when you inevitably <laughs> score a strike. Right. I, that's why I never score strikes, you know, because <laughs> I'm never put pressure to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll grab that like shitty little ramp thing and I'm like this is going to be me for the whole day they're like Nathan that's for children I'm like shush <laughs> this is the only <laughs> way I hit a pin guys <laughs>